I'm the Director of Education here at the zoo, and I'd like to welcome you tonight to our science seminar series. Um, we have a lot going on. As you can see, um, what I'd like to do is talk about a few upcoming lectures and a couple of other opportunities before I turn the podium over to Rose Jansen from the Academy, who will talk more about the science seminar series and then also introduce our speaker. So we've had um, a few really neat late additions to our Conservation Conversation series. Um, on Thursday, March 10th, we have a noontime brown bag lecture by Patty Biao. She's the director of Amazon programs with Conservation International. Patty's a graduate of the University of Missouri-St. Louis, which is a really nice connection. And she's leading an amazing conservation effort in Brazil that have been unbelievably successful in stopping rainforest destruction. It's really, really cool. Local interest groups consisting of all the local stakeholders from indigenous peoples to towns and cities to large corporations have come up with a communal land management plans that have not only stopped but reversed the destruction of rainforest in much of Amazona. And they've been successful in trading carbon credits on the global market. So that should be really a lot of fun, very interesting, and that's just coming up really soon, Thursday, March 10th. And that's um, noon to 1 p.m. and it's in the lecture hall that's immediately downstairs from here. Then on Tuesday, March 29th, we're welcoming Paul Nelson. He's with the United States Forest Service um, and he's a, really one of the premier ecologists in the state of Missouri. Patch burn grazing is a management technique that's used in a lot of prairie management here in Missouri and elsewhere. And it is, it's become somewhat controversial. Um, so Paul is going to talk about the implementation of patch burn grazing, which is a, a system that rotates a grazer like bi bison or cattle, and the use of prescribed fire on tall grass prairies to keep down some of the invasive um, species, particularly plant species there. In Missouri, we have some of the last remaining fragments of this once dominant ecosystem. Um, and however, there, there are some dangers associated with this practice and some new information that's coming out. Uh, so Paul's visit with us will be on Tuesday, March 29th. That's in the evening here in this lecture theater. Um, and that program's a joint venture between the zoo, Forest Park Forever, and the Missouri Native Plant Society, in addition to the Academy of Science St. Louis. Then another thing, I'd like to always make sure to remind this audience, um, we have amazing travel programs. There's a brochure out front that's a really pretty picture with postcard with lots of different images, different animals. And you can join zoo experts traveling all around the world to visit amazing places and see incredible wildlife. We've got a group going to Yellowstone in May. We'll be tracking wolves. Um, we've got a group going to Botswana in August. Um, groups to Kenya, Alaska, and so on. Um, so please, if you're interested in that kind of program, make sure to pick up one of the brochures out front, um, or you can always check on the zoo's website. And now I'd like to introduce Rose Jansen from the Academy of Science St. Louis. Good evening. Uh, my name is Rose. I'm with the Academy of Science St. Louis, as Louise said, and we're very pleased to partner with the St. Louis Zoo to bring you the very popular and long-running science seminar series that features some of the area's top scientists on current topics in science. A number of you are Academy members and friends, and for those of you who are not familiar with us, I'm going to take just a moment to tell you a little bit about who we are and to mention a couple additional upcoming public science seminars that you might have an interest in attending. The Academy is a local nonprofit. We've been serving the St. Louis community since 1856, so very, for a very long time. We have a long-standing mission to advance the public understanding of science and inspire the next generation of scientists and science advocates. And we continue to celebrate more than 150 years of community service by offering a broad range of free and low-cost public science programming, collaborative seminar series, and trips and tours that highlight science at venues throughout the region. And you can find more information on the Academy and our publicly accessible programs at academyofsciencestl.org. You may also visit us on Facebook or Twitter or pick up some of our literature that's just outside the auditorium at the visitor's desk on your way out. And if you'd like to receive e-notification of upcoming Academy and St. Louis Zoo public lectures and events, we'll have some e-news sign-up sheets that will make their way around the audience. There's one as well out at the visitor's desk. 
Uh, following tonight's Q&A, we'll have stickers available also at the visitor's desk for any students who need to verify their attendance here tonight. Uh, so some upcoming Academy Public Partnership events that you might have an interest in attending. This Friday at 7.30 p.m. on the Washington University Danforth campus in the Laboratory Sciences Building, we have former Naval Criminal Investigative Service Senior Chemist with the NCIS Regional Forensic Lab in San Diego, Fellow of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, Criminalistics Section, and Editor of Forensic Analysis on the Cutting Edge, New Methods for Trace Evidence Analysis, Robert Blackledge, talks about glitter as contact trace evidence, in crime scene investigations in CSI Sparkles and Shines, Glitter as Forensic Evidence. And for more information, you can contact Jeff Cornelius at principia.edu. So it's jeff.cornelius at principia.edu, or you can call 618-374-5296. And there is some information on our website about that talk as well. Um, on Thursday, March 10, as Louise mentioned, from 12 to 1, also part of the Conservation Conversation Series with the zoo, we're hosting a brown bag lunch seminar that features Patty Bio, Director of Amazon Programs with Conservation International. On Friday, March 11th, uh, at the Center of Clayton and as part of our On Science Series with Oasis St. Louis, University of Missouri-Columbia entomology professor Dr. Richard Hausman talks about bed bugs, getting reacquainted with an old antagonist, you do need to register for this event, and you can do so by calling 314-533-8586. And then on Wednesday, March 23 at 7 p.m., we have science writer, best-selling author, and featured speaker, Rebecca Sklut. She will be at the Missouri History Museum as part of a new economics series, Class the Great Divide, to talk about her New York Times best-selling debut, debut book, the, Immort the Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, which tells the story of Henrietta, whom scientists know as Hala. Her cells were taken without her knowledge and became one of the most important tools in medicine. They were the first immortal human cells grown in culture, and they are still alive today, even though she has been deceased for nearly 60 years. HALA cells were vital for developing the polio vaccine, uncovered secrets of cancer, viruses, and the effects of the atom bomb, helped to lead to important advances like in vitro fertilization, cloning, and gene mapping, and have been bought and sold by the billions. There is some information on that talk and that series out at the visitor's desk. Uh, you can find more information on these and additional upcoming science opportunities on our website or in the literature we've left for you to take with you today before you leave. So with that said, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Dan Chiris. Dr. Chiris is the founder and director of the Evergreen Institute, president of Sustainable Systems Design, Inc., and a nationally known author of more than two dozen books on green building, residential renewable energy, and sustainability. He is a former college professor with years of study and writing in the field of sustainable development who put his ideas into action when he built a state-of-the-art rammed earth tire and straw bale home in Evergreen, Colorado. He is currently a visiting professor at Colorado College where he teaches courses on renewable energy, ecological design, and sustainable development. He writes extensively for magazines, journals, newspapers, newsletters, and has published approximately 250 articles on environmental issues sustainability, natural building, natural plaster, green building, and passive solar heating and cooling. His articles appear regularly in Home Power, Mother Earth News, Natural Home, Solar Today, and The Last Straw. You should know that Dan paid his last electric bill in June of 1996. He is here with us tonight to talk about re-energizing America, renewable energy solutions for the future, and we'll have some of Dr. Chiris's books available for purchase and signing by the author just outside the auditorium following tonight's talk. So won't you please join me in welcoming Dr. Dan Chiris. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, absolute pleasure. And um, I'll get suited up here. <clears throat> I want to thank all of you for coming here tonight and thank Jim Jordan and uh, Rose for having me here in Maplewood Richmond Heights School for helping make that possible. I spent the afternoon with those guys who are doing some incredible things at the school um, for sustainability. So it's great to see happen. Um, so it's a real pleasure. Thank you so much. I hope you get a lot out today. Um, science has been very near and dear to my heart. I have a PhD from the University of Kansas School of Medicine. 
I studied actually reproductive physiology of all things. I was an expert on ovarian hormones and, uh, and pituitary hormones. But the environment caught my eye while I was still in graduate school and, and uh, I was very fortunate to be able to sort of transition careers and uh, you know, spend a lot of time studying sustainability, <clears throat> environmental issues, uh, renewable energy, and all that thing, all that stuff. Uh, you know, science gets a bad rap. You know, we, we oftentimes think of science as that stuff those eggheads do, you know, that boring, difficult to understand, tedious work that, uh, you know, just the brightest among us can do. But frankly, science is some of the coolest stuff around. It is just plain fun for the mind. Um, what we learn in science is, is amazing. Um, and I, those of you youngsters who are here who are thinking about pursuing careers in science, I wish you the best because you couldn't find a more entertaining career. Um, we're allowed to explore all kinds of interesting avenues from the, the microscopic and atomic to the macroscopic. And we're, we're treated with some of the most fascinating mysteries uh, around. So, so I wish you well, and, and I hope you enjoy it. And let's, let's help people understand that this science isn't just something for us, us uh, eggheads, but it's really cool stuff that has a lot of tremendous applications. What I want to talk to you about today is you know, a little bit about where we're going. I'll tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, and then our, our focus today really is on energy. We're very, very fortunate. We're in the beginning of a revolution. We're really in the beginning of a, a, a major revolution in human society. You know, we've had the Industrial Revolution, um, the Information Revolution. We are in the very beginning of a sustainable revolution. Human society is finding ways to, let me see if this is on, finding ways to generate uh, energy sustainably. And it's primarily going to be through renewable energy forms. And it's happening whether we like it or not. Even states like Missouri that are not known for um, progressive energy policy, to be very honest with you, are, have made major strides in ensuring, assuring that we will, all of us, will be powered in the future by renewables. So it's exciting to see happen for someone like myself who's been working in this field since the 1970s. It's exciting to see it happening throughout the country and throughout the world, people turning to renewable. And it's not just one solar system at a time. It's states and nations who have made major commitments to renewable energy. Germany, for example, the state of California, have both made commitments to convert their economies entirely to renewable energy. How exciting is that? Um, so we're going to talk about why we want to do this. Why do we want to turn, why turn to renewables and its partner uh, efficiency? Because they work really well together. Efficiency and renewable energy work really, really well together. Efficiency works well with any form of energy. And then we're going to, to talk about some of the options that are available to us and how we can meet our energy needs sustainably. What are, what are some of the options available to us? Um, and essentially what, we're, what you're getting tonight is a glimpse into your energy future. I can guarantee that the youngsters among us tonight um, will be driving electric cars in their lifetimes and in not the too distant future. Now wait till you get your driver's license, kids, but you know, you will be driving electric cars and many of us who are a little bit older will as well. So that's something that's happening as we speak. I also want to talk to you about the feasibility of this, of the feasibility of efficiency in renewable energy because like science, renewable energy gets a bad rap. There are a fair number of folks out there who, um, how shall I say this tactfully, who do their level best to, to, um, to cast doubt, to, to um, make us wonder whether we really can turn away from oil and natural gas and coal, whether we really can power our future with renewable energy. Um, and I hope when you leave tonight that you will, one, understand that there is a ton of renewable energy out there available to us. Many more, much more renewable energy 
than non-renewable. So the supplies are enormous. The, 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 and so I hope you understand not only that there is an enormous amount of renewable energy there for the taking, but it's also uh, many of the technologies are quite cost effective now. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about myself. I, um, Rose mentioned that I am an author and I am an educator. I've been actually teaching at the college level since 1976 when I got my first teaching position at the University of Colorado in Denver. Um, I lasted four years in academia before I split. I retired to become a writer and, and I've spent a career writing about science. Um, it's been a fascinating career and I'm amazed that I get paid to do this. I get paid to sit down in the morning and open up books and read and, and learn things and then sit down and write about it. Um, so it's, it's been a wonderful career and I, I also wish that amongst, uh, to, I wish that for all of you too, is that you can find a career that's been as rewarding, that you can find a career that actually allows you to pursue your interest. My mutual, my interest in science, my interest in the environment, my interest in sustainability, and my interest in writing. So um, it's one of the great secrets in life. Find something that you really enjoy doing and then make a living at it. I do a lot of consulting on green building program, green building projects throughout North America, uh, Canada, throughout the entire United States, and even into Central America. I've had a couple projects in Central America. How tough is that? I had a, a big project 60 miles off the coast of Panama City which required my constant attention. I had to spend quite a lot of time down there on a remote island in Panama. So uh, life's pretty rough. Um, so I've done a lot of consulting. I'm a certified wind site assessor and solar site assessor. Do a lot of public speaking like this. And I'm director of the Evergreen Institute. And um, I'm also a practitioner. I practice what I preach. Um, I've been, I've been um, doing this stuff for a lot of years since the 1970s. This is my home in Colorado. It's an earth sheltered house built almost entirely out of renewable, um, or excuse me, out of recycled materials. I, I, can't, I can't see it from here, but if you look carefully, you can, you can see there's grass growing on the roof. The, the house is sheltered. It's buried into the, you know, it's, it's built into the hillside. So it uh, stays extremely warm in the winter and uh, quite cool in the summer. So um, <clears throat> this house is passive solar. It's heated almost entirely by that low angled winter sun. It's also off grid, even though the electric line just runs down at the end of our property about 150 feet away, we power the house entirely off this very small solar electric system. And uh, it's about uh, a one kW system, about a thousand watt system, and it powers everything in the house because we've, everything in there is super energy efficient. So we're able to operate a 2400 square foot home off of what is, would be a really tiny uh, solar system. Uh, like I said, the house is built out of lots of recycled materials. You can see these, this retaining wall here. You can notice the round structures here. Those are actually, actually automobile tires, discarded automobile tires that we packed with dirt and then covered with cement stucco. The interior walls of the house are also built out of those. That, that, uh, that wall continues around and forms the exterior wall of the house. The living room's built out of straw bales. You can't really tell from here, but it's built out of straw bales. And virtually every product in here is recycled. Um, as Rose mentioned, we haven't paid an electric bill since the June, of, June of 1996. It's not because I've kind of forgotten to send the check in, but rather because we're off grid. We generate all of our own electricity with this tiny solar electric system. Now, one of the benefits of this, of, of living this way, is affordability. Now. Um, for years, our natural gas bill in this house, and you can see this is the interior of the house. For years, the natural gas bill in this house has been about $12 to $13 a month. That supplies the stove and a water heater, and it's just myself and my two boys, so we're fairly frugal, but $12 to $13 a month um, natural gas bill. Then in the, in the early 2000s, natural gas prices tripled, and so our bill went up to 13 to 17 dollars a month. So um, the neat thing about this is we've saved close to 20 thousand dollars on heating and cooling costs in the past 14 years. And so people will say, well, you can't do solar because it's expensive. Here you can say you can we can say that solar actually makes good sense. It's not why would you build a passive solar house, but why wouldn't you? 
if you could save $20,000 uh, on a house like this, and it costs maybe $1,000, maybe $2,000 more to build this house, and you can see we've been paid uh, over and over again for that small investment. So again, the question is why, would, why wouldn't you, you know, people say why would you build green or why would you build with solar? The real question is why wouldn't you? If you could get free heat for life, free cooling for life, why wouldn't you do it? Um, the house is airtight and energy efficient. Um, all non-toxic paints and stains and finishes because that's one of the keys when you build a super energy efficient home You make it airtight like that. You want to be careful that you don't fill it full of toxic chemicals You know toxic paints and stains and finishes that outgas potentially uh, Carcinogenic chemicals. It's earth sheltered. It's buried in the in it's it's dug into the hillside. It's passively heated and cooled um, We make all of our own electricity from sunlight in the wind and wind energy. We used all green building materials to build this. Even the, car, even the tile here, you see my kitty Bootsy, uh, all the, even the tile in here was made from a recycled mine waste. It was from a feldspar mine, and this was one of the waste products that they used to make, they used to make the uh, tile in there. We recycled all the construction waste, and even when we were done, uh, revegetated using native plants. Now just to show you that I'm not telling stories, this is our utility bill from March of 2008. Now remember, we're at 8,000 feet above sea level. So we get snow until like the middle of June. It's a very cold environment. And you can see, this is our March bill. We can see the bill was $16.10. And if you look at the breakdown of the bill, the actual natural gas was about $4. The rest is fees, you know, reading the, uh, reading the meter and, you know, surcharges and, taxes on surcharges and surcharges on taxes. You know how they, they rack up a bill pretty quickly for you. But we only had $4 worth of natural gas for a 2,400 square foot house. No heating required because it was passively heated by the sun. Super efficient home too, very, very well insulated. Now, I don't say this to brag. I don't say this at all just to brag about it, but to tell you that this is what's possible in building these days. We have fine tuned the science of building that you can build buildings that use 75, 85, 95% less energy without sacrificing the, the amenities of life. You know, you don't have to live in a cave and, and drink goat's milk, you know, to, to live sustainably. Science and, tech, science and technology have provided some amazing answers so that we can live well at a fraction of the environmental impact with a fraction of the energy requirement. So if any of you are thinking about building a new house, you might look into this because as you can see, it makes pretty good economic sense to build a house. You might spend a little more to do it, but you can save a fortune. Now, after I built that house, I really had no intention of, of specializing in green building and renewable energy. I, my work was in sustainability. That's where I was spending, that's where I spent my time trying to help folks understand what it means to live sustainably on the earth and how we go about that. And of course, green building and, and renewable energy are part of that. But I wrote this book, The Natural House, after building my house. Um, I figured I learned quite a lot about building and quite about, a lot about building with natural materials. I wrote that book. Um, and it was just going to be a one-off thing. And I was going to go back to my sustainability work. But it was so wildly successful that I followed it up with the solar house. And well, that did really well too. And then next thing I know, I had a whole new career. And, and uh, I've been very fortunate to be able to follow my interest wherever it takes me. I followed it up with this book, uh, Homeowner's Guide to Renewable Energy, which has exceeded the sales of the previous two books. So, so it's, been a, it's been very rewarding and it's been a lot of fun. I recently published this book called Green Home Improvement. It was probably my greatest financial disaster. I came out just when the economy was crashing. It was going to be, held, going to be sold in Lowe's and Home Depot, and we were looking at selling 50,000 copies a year. I don't think we've sold 3,000, you know, because Lowe's and Home Depot were all suffering when the economy crashed, and they said, well, we, we can't carry it. And so anyway, you just never know what's going to happen in life. Um, I recently published a book on wind energy. I've, I, I've studied wind energy for five or six years now, and a couple years ago published this book on small wind systems. In fact, tomorrow I'm going to Gillespie, Illinois to do a wind site assessment for a school up there, a school uh, in, they're building a brand new high school, and they want to power it with wind. 
So I'm going up to do a wind side assessment. I have a little tiny, uh, a little uh, off, uh, what, what do you call it? A spin off of that book, the big book, the little book. Um, and these books are gonna be available for sale or some, most of these books will be available for sale after the talk if any of you are interested in getting a signed copy. Um, <clears throat> I've also studied a lot of solar electricity and published this book uh, in 2009, Power from the Sun, a book on solar electricity. And then there's the little book, a little you know, offshoot of that book. So this is our Renewable Energy Center in Gerald, Missouri. Tragically, the house that I'm taking this picture from burned down, burned to the ground on January 9th. Um, you know, we, we weren't sure what caused it. They just did the final fire inspection last Wednesday and determined that um, it was some mice that chewed the electric wires and it shorted out two, two wires that then eventually ignited the whole house. So we lost everything. Um, I'm currently living, I, I'm living in this building. This is our classroom building. That white building is our classroom building. I'm currently living in the office of my office of my classroom building right now. But that's the house that unfortunately burned to the ground. But in its place, we're going to build a totally energy self-sufficient green home. We were in the process of making this home um, totally self-sufficient. We'd added a lot of insulation and just installed a solar hot water system, which melted in the fire and solar attic fans and, and uh, anyway, such is life, you know, you never know what it's going to take, where it's going to take you. But this is our, our center and I teach classes here on solar electricity, wind energy, home energy efficiency, uh, solar hot water, green building, natural building. So if any of you are inclined, I've got some, I've got some flyers that we'll, we'll make available after my talk. So if any of you are looking for some training, we're uh, happy to accommodate. This is our first solar system on the site. We put in a 4,000 watt solar system in the fall of 2009. And last year it produced over 6,000 kilowatt hours of electricity. This was our project this summer. We put a, a wind turbine, you can see it up there on the top. This is a, a wind turbine on a 200, or a hundred, excuse me, 160 foot, 126 foot tower. Um, and this guy is uh, producing electricity as well. So, <clears throat> That's me, that's what I do, and I invite all of you to come look us up on the, on the internet at evergreeninstitute.org. Come out and take classes or help uh, spread the word. Why turn to efficiency and renewable energy? Why at this point in human history is it necessary to become more efficient and to, con to, um, to transition to a renewable energy economy? What's, what's so important? Um, well, one of the problems, one of the major problems is climate change. Now, there are those who say that climate change is a myth. And frankly, my answer to them is they haven't the foggiest idea what they're talking about. They've been told by enough people that it's a myth, that it's made up, that somehow we scientists got together and conspired to come up with this global climate change, this global warming hypothesis, and foist it onto the public so we could get more funding for our research. Now, I've never heard anything wackier in my life than that. Um, the evidence behind climate change and global warming is almost overwhelming. The abundance of evidence to suggest that this is a very real phenomenon. The planet is getting warmer, and most of the warming, at least 95, 90% of the warming that's occurring is a result of our activities, our combustion of fossil fuel, which releases CO2, carbon dioxide, into the atmosphere. And we've known since the 1800s that CO2 is a greenhouse gas. What it does is it acts like a big blanket that surrounds the earth and it holds that heat in, just like a heavy jacket holds body heat in for you on a cold winter day. This, this blanket of carbon dioxide warms the planet and it's, it's very definitely causing an increase in surface temperatures, an increase in the surface temperature, water temperatures as well. And the result of that is a disaster in global climate. We're witnessing all kinds of, all kinds of phenomena, more violent storms, more violent hurricanes, more frequent flooding, um, in addition to record-breaking heat and drought in, um, in certain parts of the world. So it's a very real phenomenon, um, and I and I, um, if there are any, if there's anyone in the audience who has any doubt about it, um, 
talk to the scientists, not to the politicians who are in the back pockets of the oil companies um, who have a, a, have a way of, of trying to change minds. There's another reason, another, another reason, one of America's dirty little secrets, why we need to get serious about renewable energy now. And one of those has to do with oil, the lifeblood of our society. Um, <clears throat> uh, America is addicted to oil. George Bush said this a few years ago, and he was right. America is addicted to oil. Virtually everything in our economy comes from oil, or it's, it's derived from oil in one way or another. You know, even Tylenol, even ibuprofen, a lot of the medicines we take are made from chemicals that are extracted from oil, okay? So oil isn't just transportation fuel. It's heating fuel, it's diesel fuel, it's mothballs, it's plastic, it's drugs, it's medicine, it's synthetic clothing, it's pesticides. You know, so many products in our society actually derive from oil. Unfortunately, our addiction to oil is costing us very, very dearly at the pump. We're witnessing now, again, another rise in oil prices. I just saw uh, $3.29 just a little while ago. I talked to a gentleman in Oklahoma. He says we're paying three sixty-seven dollars a gallon for, Oklahoma, for um, gasoline in Oklahoma. We're expecting $4 a gallon oil again, at least by the end of the year. So we're paying for it very dearly in high prices, in, in lost lives, and you know we spend billions of dollars, and we have spent billions of dollars to wage war in the Middle East in an attempt to secure our supplies of oil, okay? So even before we went to war in Iraq, we typically, the US would spend $50 billion a year to guard oil tankers going in and out of the Persian Gulf. Now, oil going in and out of the Persian Gulf was worth about $10 billion, and we spent, in military expenditures, we spend $50 billion a year protecting those oil tankers. Driving the price of that oil, if we paid for that out of our pockets directly, if that price was reflected at the pump, the price of oil would be $500 dollars a barrel as opposed to a hundred dollars a barrel today. So we pay a huge price for oil. Um, <clears throat> now there's another reason for turning to efficiency in renewable energy and that is oil is on the decline and so is natural gas. And specifically we, we're seeing the end of cheap oil and cheap natural gas. Okay, I'm not saying that we'll run out of oil in, in you know, the next five years or 10 years, we still have probably 50 years of oil, but what we're running out of is cheap oil. Now let me tell you what I mean, let me tell you what I mean by that, and let me give you some statistics to help you understand America's energy situation. Currently, oil supplies 41% of our nation's energy consumption. 41% of the energy con we consume. Natural gas, constitutes about 23%. So together, about two-thirds of our energy comes from oil and natural gas, both of which are on the decline, okay? Now, unbeknownst to most Americans, oil production actually peaked in, in the U.S. in 1971. We have never produced more oil in this country since 1971. If you look at a, the graph of oil production, it peaked in 1971, and it's been on the decline ever since then. And it's not because we're, we're sitting back on our, our, and resting on our laurels. We're drilling more and more oil wells every year, but we're finding smaller and smaller pockets of oil. So U.S. oil production peaked in 1971, and so, there's a, there's a number that, we ask the question, are we running out of oil? There's a number that you need to understand, and it's called the ultimate production. And what that means is when oil is gone, when we no longer are extracting oil from our soils and from our waters, we will have produced somewhere between 225 and 250 billion barrels. So that's what's considered the ultimate production for U.S. oil. 
okay? Now what's interesting is to date we've consumed three quarters, maybe 80% of that oil. So we're on the very end of US oil right now. We've consumed probably three quarters to 80%, 75 to 80% of the oil that we own that's in US territory. Now, what's interesting is we have about 60 billion barrels of oil left within the United States, within our holdings. Now that sounds like an awful lot of oil. Um, if you put it in perspective though, we consume about 7 billion barrels of oil a year in the United States. So we have 60 billion barrels left, and we consume about 7 billion barrels a year. If we were to just rely on U.S. oil, that would mean we have about eight or nine years worth of oil within U.S. territory, okay? Eight to nine years. So fortunately, we were, are, are we running out of oil? Yes, we are. Here in the United States, we are running out of oil, but fortunately, we have foreign oil to depend on. And we, make, we currently import about 60% of the oil that we consume in this country, about 60%, much of it from countries who aren't real fond of us. So um, do we have enough oil? So the question is, whether this, we, we are running out of oil in the United States, we have foreign oil, is there enough oil globally? Is there enough oil in Saudi Arabia, in Iraq, Iran, uh, Russia, Great Britain, uh, Africa, South America, is there enough oil to continue on our economic path, to grow and prosper as a nation? Unfortunately, the answer is no. The ultimate production for the world, remember ultimate production for the US was about 225 to 250 billion barrels. Scientists believe, geologists believe, uh, <clears throat> that the ultimate production for, for global oil is about 2,000 billion barrels. So in other words, when we're living, you know, 100 years from now when oil is a thing of the past, um, we will have extracted somewhere around 2,000 billion barrels of oil. Now, to date, we've consumed, actually, this should be updated, we've consumed half of this, about 1,000 billion barrels. So we're about halfway gone, okay? So we've used about half the oil that's available on planet Earth. Now that may sound like a lot of oil. It appears like, wow, there's tons of oil. We, we've consumed 1,000 billion barrels. We got 1,000 billion barrels left. What's the problem? The problem is that appearances can be very, very deceiving. Even though we have a lot of oil, we're rapidly consuming it. We're consuming it at really rapid rates. Um, so oil is going to be around for a while, maybe 40, 50 years. But what I hope you get from this talk today is that it's not when we run out of oil that really matters, okay? It's not as, that's not important when we actually run out, but what's important is when global oil production peaks. When, just like in 1971, when U.S. oil production peaked and then began to decline, that's what's really crucial to us as a society. And why do we say that? Or first of all, when will production peak? Actually, I gave, I've given this speech uh, throughout the United States. Back in the early 2000s, most of the experts thought the peak would occur somewhere between 2004 and 2010. We don't really know for sure, but it's either already occurred or it's about to occur. Now, it's not one of those things where it's going to go up to a point and then just, oh, excuse me, and immediately fall off. It's more likely going to be a plateau. So many scientists, many geologists think we're on the top of that plateau and oil production from this point forward is going to start declining. All the while, we're asking for more and more oil. Americans are driving more miles every year. There are more of us. There are more Chinese who are driving vehicles. There are more people in India and in other developing countries who aspire to our lifestyles who are driving cars and consuming oil. So even ExxonMobil very quietly announced, they made very little, um, you know, very little hubbub about this, but back in, 19, in 2005, that it believed that oil would, global oil would production would peak 
somewhere between 2005 and 2010. We don't know when it may have occurred. It may be, it may have occurred. It may be very, very soon. Okay, so what? Let's consider some facts. Globally, the global world community consumes about 22 billion barrels of oil a year. And yet, we only discover about 4 billion new barrels a year, okay? So we're consuming five times more oil than we discover, okay? Um, what's interesting is the oil companies haven't made a major discovery since the 1960s. In other words, they haven't found a really big oil field since the 1960s. All of the extremely large oil fields were discovered prior to 1970. So if you look at it, um, let me see where I'm going here. Um, <clears throat> so let me just check what slide, and see if I've got the slide I'm hoping for here. I don't have it. Um, so, so the reason we can consume 22 billion barrels and yet only discover, and only discover 4 billion is because we're living off those big oil fields, which are fast on the decline. Mexico, a couple years ago, went into oil production. Massive oil fields started to go, go into decline. Indonesia, Russia, Great Britain, all the major oil producers have already, uh, have already reported that oil production has peaked and they're now on the decline. Now, there are about 50,000 oil fields just in the world, about 50,000. Only about 50 of them are really mega massive fields. And we haven't discovered a big oil field, again, since the 1960s. All right, so all of this, I know you're sitting there going, what is he talking about? Could this possibly be happening without our knowing about it? Could the government not be telling us that we're running out of oil? Well, frankly, they are. They're not telling us that we are running out of this vital resource. What's going to happen when global oil production peaks? Well, supply is not going to be able to keep up with demand. And we're seeing that now as the economy, global economy and U.S. economy start to improve. What's happening to oil prices? Demand's going up and prices are shooting through the roof um, because the demand is outstripping our ability to supply oil. And so what I'm afraid is going to happen is we're going to see, now, now that the economy is improving, we're going to see the price of oil rise. And as the price of oil rises, the price of groceries is going to, are going to rise. The price of coal is going to increase because guess what? They use diesel fuel to extract coal, and they use diesel to ship that coal to market. So you're going to see a rise in the price of everything. Now, I don't mean to be a buzzkill today, but we really need to be aware of what's actually happening and start making changes in our own life. One thing that's going to happen is that, we're, that the rising price is going to stimulate the search for more oil. There's no question about it. Um, <clears throat> but barring any new finds, and I doubt very seriously whether we will find a big North Slope oil well, um, you know, oil field, um, what, what could very likely happen are periods of inflation followed by recession, a crippling of the a global economy, okay? So we have to act and we need to act now, okay? Now, natural gas is a similar picture. Here's the graph of natural gas production in the United States. You can see that it peaked in 1970, well, actually 1973. Natural oil pre peaked in the United States in 71. Natural gas peaked in 1973. It declined and with incredible efforts, we've been able to boost it, but it's never increased to the level it was back in 1973. And there are thousands and thousands and thousands of new gas wells throughout the United States pumping out natural gas, trying to keep this from dropping too drastically. So we have to ask ourselves, can we import natural gas to make up the difference? You know, we import oil fairly easily. Can we do the same with natural gas to meet our demand? Well, we currently import about 15% of our natural gas from Canada, okay? About 15% of the natural gas that we consume is piped down to us from Canada, but Canada's running out of natural gas too. We also import about 2% in tankers, okay? It's compressed natural gas, 
It comes from all over the world. About 2% comes in, in, uh, net, uh, in tankers. And, and unfortunately, we're not really geared up to accept more natural gas. We don't have the ports in this country because most of the major cities, port cities, have actually rejected proposals to build ports to allow tankers full of natural gas to come up and unload. So in fact, there are only a, a half a dozen ports in the entire United States that are equipped to import natural gas. So we're running out of natural gas locally. There's a fair, fair amount of natural gas on the global market, but we're not geared up as a nation to accept that natural gas. So it's sort of like we've We've um, tied our shoelaces together, and we're about ready to trip over that. Um, <clears throat> so it's not likely that in the immediate future we're going to be able to import a lot of natural gas to make up this difference. But even if we could, most of the energy experts believe that natural gas production is going to peak fairly soon, too, somewhere between 2015 and 2025. So where it's not too far in the future, that we'll very likely see an increase in natural gas prices or as, as demand outstrips the supply. So there's a lot to be concerned about. And I want you to go away today not feeling depressed and suicidal or you know, not feeling like there's nothing we can do. There's a lot to worry about, but I'm hoping today to give you some hope. Um, I love this, don't let worries kill you, let the church help. Now that's what I'm here to do. Don't let, my, don't let your worries kill you. Let me help. And what I don't, I don't mean let me help kill you. Um, I have a lot of faith in humankind. I have a lot of faith. We're a pretty ingenious species. You know, uh, Winston Churchill once said about Americans, he said, you can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they've exhausted all other possibilities. And it seems like that's where we are today. We're exhausting all our possibilities, but we are coming around to the fact that 50 years of oil, 5 billion years of sunshine, how are we going to power our, our economy? How are we going to power our future? 50 years till oil's gone, we've got 5 billion years of sunshine. You tell me, in 100 years, where are we going to be getting our energy? From the sun and from the wind and other renewable resources. So I have a lot of faith in humanity that we will get there. It uh, might not be an easy ride, but we'll get there. Now, I have a special faith, special faith in our youth. Um, uh, there was a second grade teacher who passed around this list of famous quotes. And uh, just to show you how ingenious our youth are, so she'd give the first part of the quote and then ask her students to come up with a second. So the first one, better safe than, what's the answer? A punch a fifth grader, okay. Next one was, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Actually, it's the new math, okay. Next one, a penny saved is? A penny earned. Well, these kids are smart, not much. <laughs> Okay, they got that right. Finally, laugh and the whole world laughs with you, cry and you never have to, you have to blow your nose for, <laughs> all right. Children should be seen and not heard, actually spanked or grounded. Come on, what's wrong with you kids up front? I thought you'd get this one. And then finally, better late than pregnant, okay. All right. It's a pretty smart group of kids. Pretty smart group of kids. So what do we do, all right? What do we do to build a renewable energy economy? Well, one of the first things we need is a nationwide energy conservation strategy. Beginning in our own communities, in fact, beginning in our own homes, saving energy is five times cheaper than making new energy. It is much, much easier to save energy by sealing up the leaks in your house, adding insulation, it's much easier and much cheaper than it is to put a new solar system on your house. So the very first thing we sh as a nation should be doing is finding ways to save energy, to use it more efficiently. It's estimated that we waste 50 to 75 percent of the energy that we consume in our nation. 50 to 75 percent. Now that's the dark cloud. The silver lining is hey, there's a huge amount of energy we can tap into, 
by just being more efficient. Okay, so that's our first challenge. As individuals, how can we save energy? How can we use energy more efficiently? And there are all kinds of ways to do that. And then we need to develop new energy resources, especially renewable energy, because it's going to be with us for a long, long time. But we need to develop our new energy resources very, very wisely. We have to understand, for example, that natural gas does more than heat our homes and cook our food. It also provides hot water, but it's used in the industry to produce all kinds of things. Um, even, even fertilizer is produced from natural gas, and it's also used to make electricity. So when we, when we look at, we look at declining supplies of natural gas, we think we contemplate declining supplies of natural gas, we don't just need more natural gas, we need to find ways to heat our homes, okay? Maybe it doesn't even involve natural gas. It could be solar heating. How can we cook our food? How do we heat our water? That could be a solar hot water system. How does industry make products? How do we generate electricity? So another thing I hope you get from all this is that we just don't need more oil or more natural gas. We need to replace the services that they provide, okay? That's what we really need to be after. It's not just, oh, we're running out of natural gas, let's get some more. No, no, we're running out of something to heat our homes, to cook our food, to, to heat our water, to, to make, pesti to make uh, fertilizer. We need to find substitutes for these, and it may not be natural gas. Same thing with oil. I told you earlier, oil is an amazing resource. A barrel of oil contains over 2,000 chemicals. 2,000 chemicals from which we make all kinds of things, diesel fuel and gas, um, gasoline and jet fuel, heating oil, the asphalt, the blacktop, on the highways. Guess where that comes from? It comes from a barrel of oil. And then there's all those chemical feedstocks, which we make drugs from, and prescription drugs, and over-the-counter drugs, and um, mothballs, and plastics, and all sorts of things. So when we when we talk about oil declining, we don't just necessarily need more oil. We need something to power our cars, our trucks, our planes, our jets, our boats. We need ways to heat our homes and make roads and make chemicals, make, make drugs and, and medicine for ourselves. So our goals here, um, you know, environmentalists get a bad rap, um, a real bad rap. We're seen oftentimes as, as standing in the way of progress that somehow we care more about trees than we do about people. Um, but frankly, when you think about this, what our, really, our goals are in promoting renewable energy is to create a stronger country, okay? That's what we're about. We're trying to create a stronger country so we don't have to endure this, this, uh, this um, um, roller coaster ride of rising prices uh, for oil. We're trying to create a healthier economy too, because let's face it, renewable energy is free, and it will be until someone figures out a way to charge for it, the resource itself is free. So it provides a great hedge against inflation. So we're trying to find ways to build a stronger economy and a healthier economy. And through solutions like this, this wind turbine in northeastern Colorado, um, we're about making, or we're about promoting economic prosperity. It's not about it's not about standing in the way of progress, but it's about creating a new kind of progress and basically a better and a safer future for all of us. So bear that in mind. It's not, we're not standing in the way of progress, but we're, we're inviting people to a new energy future. And let's take a glimpse into the energy future. And these are technologies, many of these technologies are available now, and many of them are quite cost competitive now, so don't let anybody tell you, well, solar's just too expensive, we can't do solar. Well, the fact of the matter is there's several solar technologies that are very, very cost competitive. Solar hot water, for example, extremely cost competitive. It's so much cheaper than electric water heat, for example, and it always pencils out better than, say, natural gas water heat. So there are a lot of technologies that make sense now. So as natural gas supplies decline, we have to ask ourselves, how are we going to keep our homes warm? How are we going to heat our homes in those bitter cold winters? 
Well, again, remember, we, the first, the simplest things are the most cost effective. One of them is to weatherize. Um, our homes are like Swiss cheese. If you could take the leaks in the walls and the foundation of your home, around doors and windows, in the, in the roof, if you could take up all those little tiny leaks, they'd be equal to a window three feet by three feet open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. That's how leaky your homes are. And if you live in a house built in the 1820s, it's much bigger than that. So we're leaking all this valuable energy just because we're too lazy to get out and buy a clock gun and seal up all those little leaks and, and apply some weather stripping. That alone, that measure alone, can drop your energy bill by 10, 20%, just sealing up the leaks in your building envelope. Okay, So that's what we mean by weatherization, is to seal up those leaks. Um, we can also, also part of this strategy is to add insulation. Most of our homes are woefully ins under insulated. You know, the, most of our homes in this area, in fact, throughout the entire United States, most of our homes are kind of the equivalent of standing out in a blizzard wearing nothing but a light sweater. We are so under insulated, it would make your head spin. We might have R13 or 19 in those ceilings, maybe R30, but that's half of what we need. We need much more insulation in our homes to keep us warm. You wouldn't dream of going out and standing in a blizzard in a light sweater, would you? No, you'd, you'd seal up, well, you know, you'd wear a weatherproof or a, a parka, and underneath that you'd have multiple sweaters, and that's what we need to do to our homes. Um, it'll save us a fortune individually and make, could create hundreds of thousands of jobs. Uh, <clears throat> another option is to retrofit your home for passive solar. This is a brand new home uh, that's a passive solar home like my house in Colorado. It's oriented to the south and it has most of its windows are on the south side. And that allows that low angled winter sun to enter the home and to heat it. Now we've known about this technology for several thousand years. The Greeks used it. The Greeks used passive solar heating. Orient a building to the south, put the windows on the south side, and let that sun, that low angled winter sun, stream in and heat the home. In fact, the Greeks considered anyone who didn't solar heat their home to be a barbarian. Okay? So, what does that tell us about us? Okay? So, Patrick, passive solar. There are solar hot water systems for space heating, and I'm going to show you some pictures of these, and solar hot air systems for. Um, adding on to homes to, to heat them with solar energy. There are new technologies called heat pumps, which actually extract heat from the air, even on a cold day, or extract heat from the ground and deposit inside our homes. Um, of course, there's the old, the old standby wood stoves. That's sort of the, the black sheep of the renewable energy family. Um, and there are uh, another type, a fancy type of uh, wood stove, or the masonry heater. So always remember, efficiency first. Whatever you do, don't go out and buy a solar hot water system or a solar electric system until you've made your home as efficient as possible. One thing you might consider doing is hiring someone to do a blower door test. Now this is a device that they hook up to the front door of your house. You can see it's got a big fan on it. And what they do is they close, they open all the doors inside your house, close all the windows and outside doors, and they turn this fan on and it sucks air out of the house. And th that air is replaced by, all, by air flowing through all those leaks in the building envelope. So as you suck air out through the front door, hopefully the cat doesn't go through the fan, but as you suck that air out, it just draws air in through all those leaks, and then they can actually tell how leaky it is using this little meter. It tells you how leaky it is. And then when they're done, they turn the fan around in reverse and it blows air in. And you can take a little smoke gun and walk around the house, around windows and at the base of your floor, or base of your walls, with this little smoke, um, smoke stick or a smoke gun. And you'll see that smoke just zipping out through those openings. And you can take a, a caulk gun and seal them up and make your house much more comfortable and energy efficient. And it costs very, very little to do that. So it's something to consider very, very um, seriously, and not only does it save us energy during the summer or winter, but it saves a lot during the winter. So once you find the leaks, it's necessary to, to caulk them 
use silicone caulk and weather strip them, seal up, seal up those creek, creeks, <laughs> seal up those cracks in the building envelope. Um, in those cracks allow cold air to blow in in the winter, and they also allow, uh, on a, on a non-windy day, they allow heat from our furnaces to escape. So you can't win. You know, cracks in the building envelope penalize us by either allowing cold air to come in or, or allowing hot air inside the home to escape. Okay? The most common sites are around, you know, the most common sites for leakage are right at the base of walls, around doors and windows, and uh, upstairs, or, and, and upstairs, a lot of times there'll be a leak. There'll be a lot of leakage um, at the ceiling height. If you have uh, recessed lights, for example, in your ceiling, or if you have one of those big house fans, those whole house fans, boy, those leak energy like crazy. Seal those up during the winter. Okay. Here's something very simple you can do. It costs two dollars and fifty-nine cents to get a package of these. They're little gaskets that you put on your electrical outlets. You'd be surprised on a cold winter day when the wind's blowing. Go around your house and feel your electric outlets and your light switches, and you'll feel cold air blowing in. It comes in through the attic and then down through the wall cavities. And you can, you can take the cover plates off your, uh, your um, electrical outlets and light switches and replace them and, and put these little gaskets in there, and it'll, it'll um, dramatically reduce the airflow. So it's something very simple to do. Um, so that's your homework for this weekend. Everybody get to the hardware store and at least get a package of those going, okay? Um, another thing, once you seal up the leaks in the building envelope, then it's time to insulate. Then it's time to insulate. And I think there's going to be a huge market for uh, people who do the energy audits, perform those energy audits, and people who seal up homes, they weatherize them, and add insulation. That's going to be a mega industry in this country because our homes are so inefficient, okay? Um, insulate only after you've sealed up the leaks in the building envelope first, though. Okay? You don't want to add insulation before because if you have moist air, if moist air leaks through those leaks and ends up in your insulation, it's, it's the same thing. It has the same effect of wearing a wet shirt on a cold day. You're going to feel colder. Um, ins a wet insulation, its, it's value, it's what we call its R value, its resistance to heat, drops by half. Okay? So it's just like if you guys had a wet shirt on, you went outside, you're going to feel a lot colder. Same thing in a house. If your insulation's wet, it's not going to do as good a job of holding the heat in. So insulate, insulate, insulate. You can make tremendous strides together. Just by sealing up the leaks and insulating, you can easily reduce your heating and cooling costs by 30 to 50 percent. You know, I see neighbors go through 8, 9, 10, 12 cords of wood a year, and all they need to do is go add another 10 inches of, ins inches of insulation, and they could knock that down to three or four cords a year of firewood. So we, we work really, really hard to pay our utility bills, but we're spinning our wheels. We're working really, really hard, and we're just letting all that energy leak out because there's not enough insulation, or it's leaking out through cracks in the building envelope. All right, windows. Let's see where we are time-wise here. Okay, um, windows, another area of tremendous heat loss, and in the, in the winter and heat gain. There's some really new technologies, some very interesting technologies now that are helping windows, helping us improve the performance of windows. And it's called a low E coating. And it's a very thin layer of either silver or tin oxide that's sprayed on the inside surface of the outside pane of glass. And what it does is that this allows sunlight to enter, enter a room and then what, what I'm, I misspoke, it's on the inside surface of the inside pane of glass. So it allows the sunlight to enter a room, but it blocks the long wavelength infrared radiation or heat. So this is called a low E coating and essentially helps hold heat into the building. Um, and in the summer, it does the opposite. It, it keeps the heat out of the building. So that's been a major technological advance in windows that have helped us improve the efficiency of our homes very dramatically. So if you're looking at installing new windows, which actually should be the very last thing you do because it's one of the most expensive things to do. You hear about it on the news or on uh, television all the time, you know, get new windows and save all this energy. Actually, it's the very, it should be the very, very last thing on your list because it is so darn expensive. And the return on investment is so much smaller than any of the other things you can do, like sealing up the leaks 
and uh, adding insulation. So, so that's, that's what it does. You know, this is kind of an artist uh, diagram. See, in the winter, it keeps heat in. In the summer, it keeps heat out. All right, so you stay warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Passive solar is a wonderful technology. If anybody, is anybody in here thinking about building a new house? Any hands going up? Not right now, okay. So um, passive solar is a great technology. It costs very little. Um, oftentimes you can build a passive solar home at the same cost and you get basically free heat for life. There are other kinds of, of ways to generate space heat, to heat a home. Um, besides this, like a, an attached sun space like this, you want to be real careful um, with this design. You don't want an all glass roof. You can imagine what that's like in August here in Missouri. Uh, when it's 105 degrees out, you can imagine the temperature inside there. So you want to be really careful about these attached sun spaces. But here's a solar system up on the roof that is also used to provide space heat, okay, to help heat houses. Okay. And there's been some really incredible technologi technological developments in this area as well. This is, a, this is actually a glass tube, a glass cylinder, about uh, three inches in diameter. And it's evacuated. It's in a vacuum. And a vacuum is a very poor conductor of heat. And inside these tubes is a little pipe, a little black pipe. And on the sides of the pipe are these fins that increase the surface area. So when the sun shines on those fins and the pipe, it heats them up. And inside is alcohol. And what happens is that he, as that alcohol heats up, it rises by convection. You know, a hot fluid will expand, become lighter, and rise. And so what happens is that alcohol carries the heat up. It expands and rises, and it flows up through those pipes. And then it deposits its heat up, up top in a device called a heat exchanger. And then that heat is whisked away, either to provide space heat or to provide um, you know, just domestic hot water. So this is a really neat innovation. And you can take one of these tubes, fill that inside pipe with water, and stick it in a chest freezer, and it takes five days before it freezes. And vacuums make incredible insulation. So all of the benefit of science and technology, we find these amazing new technologies that are available to us that help us convert to a solar energy economy. Now here's another technology for retrofitting existing homes. It's called a solar hot air system. And what you, what you can see here is that it's just a collector that you mount on the south side of a home. And what that collector does is, it, is you, you puncture a hole, you put a hole in the wall, you know, seal it up nice, but you run a pipe through the wall into the unit, another pipe here, and there's a little fan here, and it, it pulls the cold air in from the room, it heats it up, because this is exposed to the sun, and then that hot air is dumped back into the house. Very affordable technology and a great way to retrofit a home for passive solar or for, for solar heat. And that's what it looks like. Here's the, here's the unit. This comes from a company in California. And what I really like about it, remember I told you there was a little pump in there. It also has a solar electric panel up top that generates all the electricity needed to run that pump. Now, how cool is that? I mean, that is just, that is just great technology, great use of science and technology. Now, wood heat's been around forever, and you know some of you have had, may have had good experiences with wood, some may have had bad experiences with wood, but wood is a renewable resource. If we plant the trees that we cut down, if we replant, it can be considered a renewable resource. It's still the dirtiest of all the renewables, but a lot of folks in rural, in rural counties here in the Midwest, um, a lot of folks do, do depend or rely on wood heat and one of the things you can say about it is that the efficiencies of the wood stoves have improved dramatically since the 1970s. They're much, much cleaner, much, much more efficient. So if you have to rely on wood, be sure to get an efficient um, water heater, or ex excuse me, an efficient wood stove. This is a pellet stove, and a pellet stove burns little tiny pellets, kind of look like rabbit food, if you've ever seen rabbit food, little cylindrical pellets. And it's made from the waste product from, from the timber industry. Uh, I lived in Montana for a while, up in Manhattan, Montana, population 356. And right next door was a, was, a town, was a town, and they had a big sawmill. And all the sawdust from that mill, they would burn. 
but they put it in these big conical um, incinerators and it, sawdust doesn't really burn very well and it would just sit there and smolder for days and release all this toxic pollution into the environment. And so the wood industry, the timber industry, got to thinking, well, what, do we, what can we do with this? Instead of, instead of polluting the air that we breathe, um, just getting rid of this stuff, what can we do with it? And they came up with the idea of making pellets out of it and taking that waste product and turning it into a, a profitable item. And, and so that's where the pellet stove came from, is the use of a waste product, again, science and technology, to the rescue to help us burn in a much cleaner fashion what was otherwise burned in an extraordinarily dirty fashion. So um, that's a technology that has a lot of promise as well. Now, this is one of my favorites, and I have to admit that this is not very practical for most of us. This is called a masonry heater, but I just love these things to death. It's a, it is a product actually of the 1600s, the, the, what's called the Little Ice Age hit Europe, and they were running out of wood. They were burning everything they had, and several kings in several countries um, challenged their masons to come up with a much more efficient way of burning wood. And they came up with this thing called a masonry heater. And it's basically a very high mass wood stove that burns at extremely high temperatures. Most wood stoves burn at about 600 to 900 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you could measure, you could measure the temperature of the fire, it burns at about 600 to 900 degrees. And unfortunately, that only burns about half of what's combustible in wood. About 50% of what's combustible is the solid, you know, the solid wood particles, but there's a lot of gases and liquids in wood and they actually burn at a much higher temperature. They burn at about 1100 degrees or 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. And by designing this wood stove, this masonry heater, in such a way that they insulate that box, they get a lot of air in there and turbulent air, they can get the temperatures in there up to about 1200 degrees. So they burn all of the wood. They, get, they ring out every BTU that's available in that wood. And then instead of letting that uh, hot, the hot gases just escape up through a flue pipe, well, let me show you some pictures of them because they're absolutely lovely. So instead of letting that hot air just go straight up through a flue pipe, what they do is it, they have a, a flue that goes like this. It goes down here, so the hot air goes through here, and then back up before it goes out. Now what does that do? That just allows the heat to flow through the interior of that wood stove, which you noticed is very massive. It's built out of bricks or, or masonry material, so there's a lot of what we call thermal mass. And so as that air flows out, it gives the heat over to this thermal mass, and so that whole mass becomes heated, a couple hundred degrees Fahrenheit, and it just radiates heat into the room. So instead of having a little tiny wood stove, that's burning at 600 to 900 degrees, you now have a device that burns all, gets all, rings out virtually all the BTUs out of wood, and, and then it puts all that heat into a big, massive unit that just radiates heat into the rooms. A um, very, very effective way of producing heat, and also very attractive, you know. Most of us wouldn't put our furnaces in our living room, but this is really, uh, masonry heaters, masonry stoves become kind of a, are a furnace and also quite decorative. Very, very beautiful. So here's a drawing to show you what I've been saying. They have this super insulated firebox where the temperatures get really hot and then the, then the hot gases, instead of going straight up like they would in a wood stove, go through this serpentine flue uh, system, flowing through all that mass, giving the heat off to that mass. Okay. Now there's some other technologies as well. Um, there's this device called a ground source heat pump. Maybe you've heard of it called geothermal, okay? Geothermal. Now this is a really interesting technology. And what they do is they pump a fluid through pipes buried underground, you know, six, eight, 10 feet below the su ground surface. And they, they pump this fluid through the pipe. And I don't know if you know this, but once you get below the frost line, that's, you know, once you go down 20 inches or so, the temperature of the ground stays pretty constant and stays about 50, 55 degrees, depending on where you live. And so by running this, these, this pipe, this fluid through the pipe, they pick up that heat. They absorb that heat, and then the heat is brought inside to a special device. It's a lot like your refrigerator, actually. 
It sucks the heat out of that fluid and dumps it into your house when you need heat. Now, this is called a ground source heat pump, and it's the exact same technology that's in your refrigerator. What your refrigerator is is a food source heat pump. Let's suppose you make a pot of spaghetti and you have a lot more than you need. What do you do with it? You maybe let it cool down for a while and then you stick the pot in the refrigerator and the next morning when you pick it up, it's cold. What the refrigerator does is it sucks the heat out of that food, dumps it into your house. And so this uses the exact same technology. It, it extracts heat from the ground and there are also there are also devices, these heat pumps, that will extract heat from the air, even on a cold day, and dump it into your house. And what's really cool about these is in the, in the summer, you run it in reverse. You suck the heat out of the house and dump it back into the ground. So it's a really neat technology. Again, science and technology helping us find sustainable ways of living on this planet. And this is what it looks like. This is the, this is the refrigeration unit, if you will. This is the, the part of that device that sucks the heat coming, the heat's coming in in these pipes, it sucks it out of there, and then it dumps it into the, the duct system that blows heat throughout our house. And what's also cool, now like I said, you can run this in reverse in the summer, what's also cool is you notice there's a water heater right next to this. Surplus heat gets dumped into your water heat. So you get hot water, you get air conditioning, in the summer and you get heat in the winter, all thanks to this amazing in technology. But before we get so carried away, there's just a lot of things that you can do to save energy that are a lot cheaper. If you have never installed a water heater blanket around your water heater, that's a really good idea. They cost you about 19 bucks. It'll save you $19 a year. It's a 100% return on your investment. It's, it's almost like if you had $1,000, you put it in the bank and you got $1,000 interest that first year. I mean, it's the exact same percentage. It's 100% return on your investment. So it'll take you about 20 minutes to install. Um, there are other things like compact fluorescent light bulbs, those new crazy light bulbs. Actually, they've been around since the 1980s, but they're really catching on. You can get them for about a buck a piece. That light bulb will save you 30 to 40 to $50 over its lifetime. 30 to 40 to 50 dollars, depending on how often you use it. You know, they say there's no free lunch. This is a lunch that they pay you to eat. You know, it costs you a buck and it's going to save over its lifetime up to 50 dollars. And it's going to eliminate one ton, ton of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So there's lots of very simple things. Here are those gaskets I was talking about for light switches. And here's foam tape that can be used to, to weather strip around doors. These are the simple things. They're not very sexy but they're very, very cost-effective ways of saving energy. Here's one of my favorites. This is a water-efficient shower head, okay? This is a shower head that uses no more than two and a half gallons per minute. And by federal law, all shower heads in this country have to meet this standard, by the way. So all new shower heads actually uh, sold today are two and a half gallons or lower. If you have an old home, chances are you have a shower head that's using five to maybe seven and a half gallons a minute. By installing one of these, you can cut your, your water use and you, the amount of heat that's used to give you a hot shower easily by a couple hundred dollars a year. They, they, a family of four, the manufacturers say a family of four can save up to $250 a year. Now, okay, suppose that's an exaggeration. Suppose it only saves you $100 a year. That shower head is going to cost you maybe five, ten, fifteen dollars. Let's say it costs you ten bucks. It'll save you a hundred dollars a year in your fuel bill. That's an even better investment. So these are the kinds of things that we could do. Imagine if every every single home in the United States had a water efficient shower head. How much energy and how much water we'd save. Okay. Now. Natural gas also provides a little bit of our electricity. Ah, it's about uh, 18%. And one way to, to supply electricity as natural gas supplies wane is through solar electricity. First of all, be more efficient in the use of electricity, but also solar electricity. We call that photovoltaics. Photo meaning, excuse me, meaning light. Voltaics roughly meaning electricity, photovoltaics. Um, there's wind energy, one of my favorites. There's another option for us, and, and I think we're going to see an awful lot of solar electricity and wind. Look around. You'll see solars everywhere. 
Look on, on uh, 270 at the, the speed limit signs. They're solar powered. How many of you have noticed that? They're solar powered. Very good. So just start looking around. They're on road signs. They're all over the place. We're starting to see a lot of solar electricity on homes and businesses and a lot of wind systems, a lot of wind power. Um, <clears throat> one of your best bets is these compact fluorescent light bulbs that I was talking about. They use a quarter of the energy of a standard light bulb. Okay? So by replacing your light bulbs with these compact fluorescents, and you can get them in Home Depot and Lowe's uh, in a four pack and a six pack for about a buck a piece. So they're very, very cost effective. Um, they screw into an ordinary light socket. They have an Edison base, Thomas Edison base. And um, they last a lot longer as well. They last about 10 times longer than a standard light bulb. I have some of these in my house that in Colorado that I've had since 1985, 1988. They're still working, OK? They do cost a little bit more, but they save a fortune. Um, easily 30 40 50 60 dollars over their lifetime all right so i'm going to skip through this just in the interest of time and um just get on to some other subjects here bear with me come on okay now now the compact fluorescents are getting popular and by the way i don't know if you knew this but under president bush the united states banned compact ordinary light bulbs they were in a few years you will not be able to buy an ordinary light bulb. They're going off the market. Very quietly happened. Um, but now as compact fluorescents are getting popular, we're finding out, guess what? There's even a more efficient light bulb called an LED, light emitting diode. They're super efficient bulbs. They use 90% less energy than a standard light bulb. Now, these guys are still a little rough around the edges. But look tonight, look at stoplights as you go home. Look at taillights on cars. And you'll see these little points of light. Oftentimes, those are LED lights. I even saw them on some headlights the other day. <laughs> so we're starting to see LED lights creeping into the transportation industry. The city of Denver, for example, replaced all their stoplights with LED lights and saves them a million dollars a year in energy cost. They're that efficient, OK? So LED lights use a lot less energy than the compact fluorescent. So expect over the next 15, 10, 15 years to see the compact fluorescents go by the wayside as LEDs uh, make their way into the market. Um, they last a lot longer. They're pretty expensive, though. I have to admit, they're pretty expensive. Um, one bulb I bought the other day was 50-some dollars. Um, you know, they're pretty expensive. You can get some for $10, $20, $30, $30 but they're, they're kind of like where compact fluorescents were back in the 1980s. Really expensive, but the price will come down as we start to manufacture more of them. So you watch that, watch for that trend. It's an exciting trend. Okay. Now, solar electricity. A lot of neat things happening, happening in solar today. Um, <clears throat> Solar is going to provide electricity. It can, we're seeing a lot of systems going up on homes here in the United States, even in, here in Missouri. And we're finding, uh, we're seeing a lot of companies that are installing very, very large solar fields to produce electricity. Now, there's some real innovations, um, some very exciting innovations. Here is a solar shingle. This is an actual shingle you can put on your roof. Instead of covering your roof with ordinary shingles, you can cover it with these solar shingles. Now, my first rule of technology, though, is just because it's a cool idea doesn't mean it's a smart idea. So be really careful. This is one of those ideas. Sounds really neat. Oh, wow, we're going to cover our roof with shingles that make electricity. Well, it turns out that this is not such a good idea. The reason is that every one of these, every one of these is, is like a single solar module. And at the end are two electric leads, two wires. And they need to be connected. Those two wires need to be connected with the one, the solar uh, shingles next to it. And in order to do that, you have to drill two little holes in the roof, shove the wires in, and get someone underneath the roof to make a connection. So by the time you get done with your roof, you've got 300 holes in your roof. Okay. Now, the last time I checked, the reason we put a roof on a house is so nothing will leak in, right? We don't like to drill holes in roofs. It's not a really smart idea. So these have actually been taken off the market because they just proved to be 
too much trouble. You can't drill that many holes in a roof and not expect some leakage, okay? So just because it's a, a nifty idea, a cool idea, doesn't mean it's a smart one. Um, there are some technologies. This is the same material, okay? This is the exact same material, but it comes in a big roll, and it can be, it, it can be glued onto standing seam metal roof. And this has worked out really, really well. This is a technology that wor has worked out really well. It's called PV laminate, okay? So it's solar material that comes in a, in a long roll, can be rolled out in, and attached to one type of metal roof called standing seam metal roof. Not just any metal roof, but a special type. Here's a whole, here's a whole apartment complex covered with solar shingles. Again, really cool idea, but it didn't turn out very well. Solar systems are pretty simple, pretty simple. They're, they have solar modules called, they're uh, solar modules or sometimes they're called solar panels. That's technically not correct, but we'll go with it. Solar panels, solar modules, they produce direct current electricity. Now direct current electricity is the kind of electricity that batteries produce. It's electrons that flow in one direction, okay? So we use alternating current electricity in our homes. So these solar systems produce direct current electricity. It's fed into a device called an inverter. And what that inverter does is it converts it to alternating current. And then that alternating current electricity goes into that big old breaker box of ours, which is kind of like Grand Central Station. It carries, it has all kinds of circuits that run throughout our homes. So we can directly power our homes with that electricity. The DC is converted to AC and then it goes in, it powers all those loads. And what's cool about these systems is if you're making surplus electricity, where does it go? It goes back onto the utility grid, okay? And your neighbors consume it. But what's neat about this system is when, it, when you're putting surplus electricity, we call that backfeeding electricity onto the grid, your meter actually runs backwards. So if you produce 10 kilowatt hours of surplus electricity, the meter will run backwards. And if you need that electricity at night, it'll give you it back at no charge. So we end up using the utility as a big battery system. And so this is called a grid-connected solar electricity, solar system. And I guarantee you, this is one of the most expensive technologies we have. It's very expensive electricity. But right now, never have the modules been cheaper. The prices have, are at all time record low and there are huge incentives that are available. The federal government will give you a 30% federal tax credit for these. If you're a business, they'll give you the money immediately as a treasury department grant. If you're on Ameren, which I suspect most of you are, they'll pay for about 25% of the system cost. So they'll give you $2 a watt. Um, if you're out in the country, you can get a USDA grant that'll pay for 25% of the system. If you're a business, you can apply accelerated depreciation. So if you're a business, and you're with Ameren, you get the rebate from Ameren, you get the 30% federal tax credit, and you get accelerated depreciation, so you end up paying about a quarter of the cost for your solar systems. So it's really affordable now. It really makes solar affordable now. The government is supporting solar in part to help grow this business, to help increase this business. One of the most cost-effective technologies is the big wind turbine. These guys cost a million and a half, two million bucks a piece, but they produce so much electricity that they turn out to be very cost competitive. They certainly produce electricity very close to the cost of coal-fired electricity, and they do it without all the pollution, without all the global, uh, the greenhouse gas pollution and all the other stuff. Just to give you a perspective how big those units are, these are my two boys. We were visiting a wind farm in New York State, and these are my two boys going up to the base of one of these towers. 268 feet from the base to the top of that blade. Massive wind machines, and also very quiet. That's one of the myths about wind is it's really noisy. Um, fact is, it's extremely quiet. Um, there are people out there that don't want to see wind succeed, so they, they perpetrate myths like, oh, it kills birds, and, you know, and it, it's very noisy. Fact of the matter is, um, wind turbines do kill birds. About 50,000 birds a year die in wind turbines. Um, guess how many, how many birds die from at the, at the paws of our cats? About 270 million birds die every year 
from our kitty cats, our beloved kitty cats kill about 200, wind turbines kill 50,000, okay? Um, pesticides kill 67 million birds a year. So yeah, wind turbines kill birds, but let's put it in perspective. You know, let's get, let's get uh, real about this. Um, this is how big they are. This is a group of my students from Colorado College um, at a wind farm in northern Colorado. Look at the size, and that is a small, relatively small wind turbine. Look at the size of those blades, so you get an idea of how big they really are. Wind is the fastest growing source of energy in the world. This is just a, a look at the growth of the wind industry. It's growing extremely fast, so um, I believe that all of us are going to see a day when, um, when wind is, becomes a major source of energy in the United States. On a small scale, it's not quite as affordable. Actually, I'm being kind. On a small scale, it's much more expensive. Okay, it, uh, it's orders of magnitude cheaper for large wind. When you start in small, installing small uh, systems, it becomes more costly per unit of electricity. It still can be cost effective. Um, and the thing to remember is that wind is, is basically only applicable, whoops, uh, it's most suitable, that's a slow one, isn't it, in rural locations. Forget about it here in the city. Forget about it in the suburbs. It's just not good in those locations. There's too many trees and buildings that interrupt the wind, okay, and just make the wind very turbulent. So it really only works in rural locations where there's a lot of wind, never ever in suburban areas, okay. Um, you need at least an acre, most likely two to four acres of land to, be, to have enough room to put a wind turbine in. So that greatly limits the uh, application of wind on a small scale. And I want to warn you too about those, those wind turbines you see a lot about. They're called, uh, they're called vertical axis wind turbines. They look like an egg beater. They spin around here. Oh, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of excitement about these. And they're, they're beautiful, beautiful machines. Some of them are gorgeous machines. The problem with them is that they're almost all mounted at really low heights, like a 10-foot tower. And there's practically no wind on an annual basis at 10 feet. In order for a wind turbine to work, it has to be up on a tower 100, 120 feet above the ground, okay? So for a wind turbine to work, you can't mount it on the top of your roof, okay? You can't mount it in your backyard. There's just not enough wind to make it economically viable. They need to be on a tower at least 180, 100, 120 feet above the ground to get to the strongest winds, and that's where you start producing it. So be real careful there. You see, you'll see news reports about these wind turbines. They look lovely. But remember, just because the blades are spinning doesn't mean it's producing any electricity. And a lot of times they aren't. They're just spinning, and they haven't really begun to produce much electricity. So um, that's where good science helps you understand what's going on. Um, and I won't get into all that. America is, the Midwest is the Saudi Arabia of wind. We have some states. If you, just, if you could just install wind turbines in North and South Dakota, it would produce all the electricity we need in the entire United States. It's that windy. So we have some really terrific wind sources. We're not so hot here in Missouri. Um, Northwestern Missouri is okay. Some good wind resources here. It's a little tougher sell here in Missouri, which is why Missouri ranks as one of the lowest states as, as far as overall wind capacity. But there are some places where we could really tap into the wind in a major, major way. Okay. So one thing I want to get across to you, and I think I'm just about done here, is there's a lot of renewable energy. There's a ton of renewable energy. Don't let anybody ever tell you whoops, that we don't have uh, enough renewable energy to power our society. Um, listen, look at this statistic. The sun emits a huge amount of energy every day. And we re intercept, the planet Earth intercepts about five billionths, a half of one billionth of all the sun's energy. But that energy striking the Earth in 40 minutes is enough to power all of our energy needs for an entire year. Do you get that? 0.5 billionths of the sun's energy strikes planet Earth. If you could somehow capture that all, in a 40-minute period, it would meet all of our energy needs. Transportation, manufacturing, heating and cooling, everything, 
every bit of human energy would be satisfied by that sunlight striking the earth in a 40 minute period. So don't let anybody tell you there's not enough wind, there's not enough um, solar energy to power our society. There's a huge amount and it's there waiting for us to tap into it. All right, and you can see though, that the, the renewable resources, this is a, a, a map that comes out of the US Department of Energy from their National Renewable Energy Lab, and you can see they've got different, there are different types of renewable energy like biomass and wind and solar. And you can see some areas have a better resource than others. Clearly, everything here in red and orange and yellow is a good, is a good solar resource. Everything in blue is a good wind resource. And all of these states are good for biomass. So, so um, the, for, the good thing about energy is you can transport it across the country. We can transport uh, wind energy from, and solar energy from this part of the country to other areas that, that aren't so well endowed with wind or solar. So um, I expect to see a lot of that happening in the future, solar energy, wind energy, produced in areas that have the greatest resource being delivered to areas that don't have such a good resource. So in conclusion, I, I hope you realize that from what we've seen is we don't lack the technologies to make this happen. And we certainly don't lack the renewable energy resources. And for years, we seem to be lacking the political will. Now the tides have changed. And there are a lot of uh, folks on both sides of the aisle that uh, stand as uh, uh, staunch supporters of renewable energy. But we certainly need individuals like yourselves to help make changes. Um, you know, but and we need to be to move on this very, very quickly. I, I remind you that you can play a role in building a sustainable future. If you can only install a small solar system, that's fine. The reason we call a solar module a solar module is because it's modular. You can, you can install a thousand watt system and then add 250 watts next year or another thousand watts. So you can build these systems over time. So I encourage all of you who are interested in solar to get out there and make it happen. Um, if you're interested in learning more, I will have some books for sale afterwards and these books are also available on my website and also through uh, various bookstores. Um, it's gonna be a difficult road, there's no question about it. Just when we think we get there, there's another surprise waiting for us. I like this, there's another surprise waiting for us. So um, it's not gonna be easy, I guarantee you. But history will look back at, at us during this period and say, that was the beginning of the sustainable revolution. That was the beginning of the clean energy, renewable energy um, re, uh, 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 revolution. Now, I have great faith in humanity. If we can invent a motorized bar stool, we can pretty much do anything. <laughs> okay? And here's one of my favorite technologies as well. Let's put those little kids to work, okay? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> hey, come on. <laughs> they got to earn their way, too. So um, a closing thought. You know, we've got 30 to 50 years, as I've said, till oil is economically depleted. We've got 5 billion years before the sun dies. We actually have about a, th we have actually have about a billion years before planet Earth will be uninhabitable because the sun will have expanded by about 30% in a billion years. So we have a lot of time. I don't mean to panic you, but we, only have, we don't have five billion years, we only have a billion years. Um, but we have a heck of a lot more, a heck of a lot more sunshine than we do oil. And how are we gonna power that future? It only makes sense to get to it now. You know, and if folks in this audience who are inclined to think progressively, who are inclined to think about the future, if I can't convince you to do it, how am I gonna convince anybody else? If it's not us, who's gonna do it? And if we don't do it now, when are we going to do it? So um, the handwriting's on the wall, my friends. And um, we're going to power our future with renewable. So this picture that you saw at the very beginning, is it really, it is, isn't really, the, it's the dawn of the, uh, or the, the uh, excuse me, it's a sunset for the age of fossil fuels and it's a sunrise, it's the dawn of the age of renewable energy and we're a part of it. So thank you so much for coming out today. I'm happy to entertain any questions. Yes.
questions. I have some. I have some flyers here. Are there any questions? I have some flyers here on the Evergreen Institute. If anybody's interested in learning more about us, and I guess what I'll, I don't see any questions out there. So what I'll, I'm going to. Oh, here's a question. I'm sorry. The question is, do I think hydropower will be a part of the energy future? We've pretty much tapped out hydropower in the United States. And most of what's left is in remote areas of Alaska and Canada, a long way from society. So no, in the United States, I don't see hydropower as having a huge future, because we pretty much use what we can get. Okay? Some, yes, but not a lot. Yes? Sure, absolutely. Well, the, the question is, he's heard that, that Exxon and others have, as well have discovered that you can actually make oil from any organic material. You can make it from corn. You can make it from any organic material, algae being one of them. Do I think that's the wave of the future? Um, probably not in the quantities that we need. We need massive quantities, but it may. I don't know for sure, but um, it all depends on the cost. And you can think about how much algae they're going to have to grow to produce enough oil to replace those 22 billion barrels a year. Pardon me? Yeah. OK. Question in the back. Why did you ignore biofuels? I didn't ignore biofuels. I just didn't get to them. <laughs> I, I guess I did ignore them, didn't I? But um, I had a whole section on sustainable transportation that included biofuels, but I didn't think I'd have enough time to do that. Uh, I talked about it only in the, you know, mostly I was focusing on residential energy, so I didn't get into geothermal. There are lots of different options. You know, what, what the gentleman's talking about is there are a lot of fuels that we can make. We call them biofuels. We can make um, something called biodiesel, which is an organic uh, mixture of organic compounds that can be burned in a, in a diesel vehicle. We can make it from vegetable oil, canola oil. We can make it from soybean oil. We can make it from turkey manure, um, from garbage. We can make it from a lot of different things. And um, so that's one of the options we have for, for continuing uh, diesel fuel. Um, you can actually even burn vegetable oil directly in a car that's been properly modified. So that's an option, too. Um, whether that's going to be big, I don't know. I, I, I rather seriously doubt that, that those will become huge industries. Um, there's also hydrogen, which is a very exciting technology. The neat thing about hydrogen is you can take hydrogen, and you can either burn it directly, or you can put it into a device called a, um, a fuel cell. And that converts it to electricity. Now, what we're finding out about hydrogen, and, then, and, and in the process, the result, the only pollutant that comes out is water. So you start with water. Um, you split it into hydrogen and oxygen. You put it in a fuel cell. It makes electricity, which you can use to power your home, to run your car. The only problem with it is it's not a very efficient process. It's, it um, takes three to four times more energy to use electricity to split water, to make hydrogen, to, to put it in a fuel cell, to make electricity, to run a car. It takes three to four times more energy to do that than it does to just take that electricity directly and run the car. So I don't think hydrogen's got a great future with us either. I've got a book I, recent, I just published last year, a book on green transportation which covers a lot of these things. But I could go on. There's ethanol and, and all, all kinds of other biofuels, methane. We can use methane, um, which is a gas given off by our, um, our waste dumps, our garbage dumps. We could use that methane to power cars. So I think just like today, in the future, we'll have a diverse energy economy. We'll see a lot of, we'll still see oil and gas car. We'll see gas cars. We'll see diesel. We'll see biofuels. We'll see, we'll see, um, We'll see, uh, excuse me, vegetable oil, some, some biodiesel, certainly methane, maybe some hydrogen. Um, what am I missing? Um, we'll see a diversity of, 
fuels, and the ones that are going to win are the ones that are have the highest net energy efficiency, the ones that give us the most yield output for the amount of energy we have to put in them. Okay, so it's obviously a big subject, and I didn't really want to get into that. There was another question here in front. Yeah. Where do you fuel your house very well? Mm -hmm. How do you get your fresh air? Do you want to get fresh air in the winter? Well, when you, you do want fresh air in the winter, but here's the deal. You don't want Mother Nature in charge of that. Because when's Mother Nature going to ventilate your house? She's going to ventilate it when it's 20 below zero and the winds are blowing at 50 miles an hour. She's going to say, you wanted fresh air? Here it is. Okay? So we like to seal up tight houses really tightly. Now, most older homes, you can't seal up enough to make a difference to stop the fresh air flow. But on brand new houses, when you're building a brand new house, you can seal it up pretty tight that you end up with a problem getting fresh air. And so in those cases, what we install is something called an air-to-air -air heat exchanger. And what it does is it takes the old air in from, uh, from the inside of the house and it dumps it outside and it brings new air in. And, and so you don't lose all the heat. It passes those two air streams through a heat exchanger. So the old warm air going out takes that stale air out, the new fresh air coming in, goes in, and then the heat is transferred from the out, outgoing air to the ingoing air. So that's what we do, is we put in an air-to-air -air heat exchanger called an energy recovery ventilator. We put those in the energy tight homes, or the air, really tight homes. But most existing homes, you can't get that tight, because they weren't so very well built. So it's not a huge problem with existing homes. You can't get them so tight that you're not getting fresh air. And the thing is, though, you want to be in control of ventilation. You don't want Mother Nature deciding when she's going to ventilate your home. Okay? Question in the back. Yes? Um, what is your current solution to the fact that wind and stuff are Well, you know, that's a good question. What's the current solution to the fact that wind and solar are intermittent? Um, well, they are inter intermittent. There's no question about it. But one of the solutions is to be choose, let's start with wind. One of the solutions is to choose wind sites that are very reliable. Most of the new wind farms go into areas where the wind blows 65 to 85% of the time. OK? So that's one of the solutions. Don't put a wind system in here. Like my wind turbine in, in, in Missouri, um, come summertime, it just sits there. You know, not a good site. In the winter, it's blowing all the time. So one solution for that is to, to, to install them in places with the optimum resource. So that you have the wind, like go out to western Kansas, for example, and the wind just blows all the time. Summer, winter, spring, summer, it doesn't fall. It just doesn't matter. It blows all the time. Terrific place for wind farms. And so that's part of the solution. The other part is transferring energy. So, so the wind's not blowing in Colorado, but it's blowing in, in, in Kansas. So you transport the electricity there. Oh, so the wind, so, so the wind isn't blowing in Colorado. You use solar energy that time. So it, it's, it's all about creating a, a complex um, supply system that deals with this intermittency. And I honestly think what we'll see is we'll see solar and wind as part of our main energy supply and fossil fuels being used to back up. Okay? The new coal-fired power plants, for example, can be brought online pretty quickly. So if the wind's not blowing, you can power up one of these guys to provide the electricity while the wind's not blowing or while the sun's not blowing. And natural gas plants, same way. So my, my dream, my, my vision, I guess, is, to, is that the solar and wind and hydro and biomass will dominate the energy picture, but they'll be supplemented by these other forms of energy that give us a constant supply. And that's what we do right now, in fact. We have coal-fired power plants, and when they're not producing enough, we bring up, we charge up the, coal, the uh, uh, gas plants and make them produce energy to bring up the supply. So um, right now, there's no good way to store solar and wind energy. You know, there are a lot of people working on ways to try to store it, but it's really kind of difficult to do, and um, storage is fairly inefficient. So I don't hold a lot of hope for storage, you know, big battery banks that will store solar electricity for St. Louis to run on at, at night. You know, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen, but certainly wind farms in Illinois or, you know, in Iowa 
can transport electricity our way. If the wind's not blowing here, it's blowing up there. Okay. Well, you know, there is some interest in, in generating hydrogen, in generating hydrogen from a fuel cell when you have surplus electricity, and then using that hydrogen, putting it in a fuel cell, and then using it to generate electricity. And that's a possibility, but it might be much more cost effective just to sh send the electricity in from some neighboring state. It's probably more efficient because that is not an efficient process. S using electricity to split water and then putting that hydrogen in a fuel cell to make electricity is a very inefficient process. So my guess is that it would be it would be more efficient just to, if we've got a surplus in Arkansas, Oklahoma, or whatever, ship it in. Or fire up those coal-fired power plants. Or fire up plants that burn wood chips or something like that. Okay. Yes? The question is, if St. Louis required electricity, can we transfer it from anywhere in the U.S.? Yeah. We don't generally bring it thousands of miles, but hundreds of miles. Electricity is shipped all across the country. You know, when Colorado's lacking energy, we bring it in from Nebraska. We buy it from companies in Nebraska. So there's a lot of that that's going on right now. In the summer, when your, you know, your electric bills get really high, you know, they charge more for electricity in the summer. One of the reasons is they're buying surplus electricity on what's called the spot market. So they don't make enough amaran doesn't make enough electricity, so it has to buy it from neighboring states. And they charge a premium for that. So it's why in the summer you'll see you pay more per kilowatt hour because they're having to import electricity and buy it from other places. Any other questions? Yes? The coal company might sell a lot of coal available, and that's why it's probably in the general state of North America in the United States. But it's also a terrible greenhouse gas emitter. Yeah. Well, so what he's talking, the coal companies are right. We have a lot of coal in this country, a lot of coal, a lot of coal in the world. Sadly, it's the dirtiest fossil fuel we've got. When you burn it, it produces lots and lots of carbon dioxide, sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides, which are then converted to acids in, the, in form acid rain. And there's all kinds of ash and you know mercury that gets released into the environment. It is a dirty fuel. Even with a lot of the technologies to clean it up, it's still a very dirty fuel. Now, what they're pinning their hopes on is something called clean coal technology. And what that means is, one, they're trying to find ways to burn it more efficiently. And if you can burn it more efficiently, you produce less uh, pollution per kilowatt hour of electricity. So that's a good thing. You know, Finding ways to, to burn it efficiently Great, but like you pointed out, it's still experimental. There are a couple experimental plants that are underway. So the coal company tells us, oh, don't worry, we got clean coal. Hey, it's not even here. It's not even here yet. The other thing is carbon sequestration. They're saying, okay, so here's what we'll do. We got these coal-fired power plants. We'll make them more efficient, and we'll take the CO2 that they produce, and we'll sequester it somehow. We'll stick it down in the ground into abandoned oil wells or something. We'll tuck it away underground. What they don't tell you is that's a very energy intensive process. It increases the energy consumption at a coal-fired power plant by about 25 percent. So your mind should immediately say, wait a minute, I've got to burn 25 percent more coal to sequester all that CO2. So we're going to burn more energy, make more CO2, more nitrogen oxide, more pollutants to sequester it. And it's going to cost us a lot more. So right now, it's a lovely idea. Oh yeah, let's just take that CO2. But in my mind, it's an extremely unpractical idea. Like, look at Denver, Colorado, for example. Where are, where are they going to put the CO2? There are oil wells in Colorado, but they'd have to, first of all, compress all that CO2 that comes out of the flue pipe, compress it, pump it up in tanker, you know, take it up there in tankers or in pipelines that have to be built, ship it hundreds of miles and then inject it into the ground. Now, how practical is that? You know, what, what are we going to do with it here in, in St. Louis? What are we going to do with all that CO2? Where are we going to put it? 
to me, the clean coal, clean coal is an admirable goal. I applaud any efforts to burn coal more efficiently to reduce the pollution. The carbon sequestration, I think, is a pipe dream. I think it's something they're holding out, and they're using it, in my mind, they're using it in a very deceitful way. Because they, a lot of people think clean coal technology is here. Oh, don't worry about it. We got clean coal technology. It isn't even close to being here. Three, maybe, was it three experimental plants in the United States to sequester coal, like CO2? It, so don't pin your hopes on clean coal, um, not for a long time. And chances are it'll be very expensive, very energy intensive too. So that's my take on it. All right, any more questions? Well, you've been a wonderful audience. I appreciate all your uh, great comments, you kids. Keep up the good work. Thank you.